Next up is uh, Patrice Clark. Patrice is an MPhil student at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. Um, she is doing work that looks at the writing of uh, deaf students, uh, interferences from English um, and other factors. So she's going to be presenting today on tense and aspect in narrative writing of deaf students. There are no 
there's no GSL curriculum at present, and all the materials are in English that they are expected to use to acquire English. So I have called it an English only zone. Um, given all the languages in the contact situation, I have designed this diagram to basically summarize what I view to be the learner system which they use to produce these tests. So the three languages um, that are at folk, in, at a focal point are Jamaican Sign Language, Jamaican English, and Jamaican Creole. Um, the white dots on the screen represent all the intermediate varieties that might be produced through contact with those languages. And the dot that says other represents the home sign or ASL if it is that these students were exposed to that. So I'm using this to say that the variety of samples that would be examined are likely to show influence from all of the languages in contact depending on the student's hearing loss or their competence in English or their L1. So to talk about tense, um, tense basically is used to relate an action um, from the moment of speaking to some other point in time. And in English, it is conveyed um, using inflection and morphology. Um, so the tense that we're going to focus on is the simple tense, simple present tense, and the simple past tense. And those are formed by basically adding S to the bare form of the verb in the case of the simple present, and EG in the case of the simple past. Um, aspect talks a little bit more about um, action, but it doesn't relate to the time. It's more um, habitual or something that's in progress, um, and that is marked by the ing, by the in being added to the paper. Can't see what um, So in JSL, expressing time is a bit different from what's done in English, or even in Creole, where we have preverbal markers. In JSL, um, time is expressed using non manual cues or in reference to what is considered a timeline. So the sign as body is basically a point of reference, that's your moment of speaking. Any sign um, away for in a forward position from the sign as body would be something for future events, and anything behind or back would be more in reference to past. So any if there's an instance where there's no timeline communicated, the default interpretation is present. See that I can't find those for them to see. Um, so I looked at the study by Quigley and Hall, who examined death writers quickly in the US Hall in Jamaica, and found that um, both of them so nice that auxiliary verbs, tense markers, copulas, and the verbal system on a whole was difficult for um, deaf learners. So the production don't often mirror what is expected from English because of the disparity with um, the languages, the difference between the grammatical system of the different languages. So for this presentation, I took 48 scripts, forgive my error, and then from two schools, and all the students were between 13 and 21 years of age. Um, all the scripts were um, collected from the Jamaican Deaf Association. They had conducted a test of written language to assess the students' English competence, and um, they would have collected the data um, over the years, so I just sampled their database, basically. Um, having collected the data, um, I transcribed it and coded it using Ancount and Plan. So I wanted to use a corpus driven approach to see what was happening there rather than make a list of problems that were there. Um, these were the picture prompts used to illustrate the data. Um, 
and these are used between 2003 and 2015. I'm not sure if the students were timed. The exam itself asks that the students be given 15 minutes to write the essay, but I wasn't able to confirm through the association if they adhere to that um, requirement. So I wanted to find out, as I said before, how the simple present and past tense were formed, the progressive construction, as well as the alternate means through which they used to mark present and past tense in the writing. Um, so I transcribed the text and I ran them through a concordance software called Ancom. And I basically use the root form of the word to determine the frequency or the most frequent words in the sample. And the most frequent word used um, besides the was the form of the verb to be or its bare form. Um, there weren't a lot of function words, um, so this represented perhaps. 60% of the entire um, sample. There were 5,400 words um, overall in the, the across the body eight scripts. Ten minutes. So, okay. So in the sample, I found that the students did mark the third person singular present um, as expected, but. It was only a handful of students who were able to do that. And you did not have any over-regularization. You did not have any hypercorrection or any substitution in terms of, say, them using a process used by Jamaican Creole or Jamaican English or Jamaican Sign Language. What happened is that in cases where they did not use an inflectional morphology or form from English, the verb was bare. So there were over 700 bare verbs in comparison to what was marked for the present. The past tense was similar in that they produced very few um, past tense markers on the verbs and the Irregular forms were more frequently produced than the regular forms. There was hypercorrection with the past tense, so you would have had students producing um, things like told them, um, where told would have already been in the past tense, but they added an inflection on morphology just the same because they were producing the past. Um, for the collegates or the verbal verbs, it had a lot of constructions with the preposition of. Um, some of them were acceptable in English, some of them were not acceptable in English. But it was, it was interesting for me to see prepositions because most of the literature says um, the students often do not use preposition. So they did use it, but sometimes not as was expected, and sometimes they used it in ways um, that were acceptable. So of all the verbs produced in the sample of Elote, the students produced um, more forms of the verb to be than any other verb, and um, they used the modals in conjunction with infinitive forms as well as tense forms when they did use them. So they used them as was expected as a particle in, in say, forming the present continuous or the perfect tense. Um, these were some examples that I took from it. These examples, in the case of reduplication, um, I felt looked at influence from sign language. Um, but the reduplication here is um, what, I, what is called um, non-compound reduplication, where in the case of he, I talk a story very lie-like, 
the child was really just adding intensity to say um, the extremity of um, the event. And in the case of father and mother drink, drink water and quickly drive, drive, that was more to produce a progressive rather than um, to augment or intensify the act itself. Um, as mentioned before, there was over-organization, not just with the past tense, but also with the progressive form. And sometimes when the student produced the progressive form, it would be um, the verb, the copular, the form of the verb to be, but not in the form to, that was required by the subject to um, achieve agreement, or the verb to be itself was absent altogether, and you would just have the participle. Um, so that was a general pattern right across the text. The man is talking was the only instance I saw where they added ink to a root that could not take it um, and produce talling, which I'm not quite sure how to interpret. And um, I had previously mentioned the total example. Thank you. So the floor is open for questions now. So, so hi, hi Patrice. Patrice, thanks, thanks for that. Almost got away. <laughs> All right, so I noticed on the list that you had for the simple past tense um, that one of the sentences was evil, kill, happened, car, accident, weird. So when you were counting the past tense occurrences and looking at them, did you, you didn't take into account overall grammaticality of the utterance? No, I did not take into account grammaticality. I had only checked to see if the construction uh, met the requirements. So if you had the marker required for that. If it is that I was confused about the utterance, the meaning of the utterance, then I went there. But, but because there was also something to look at, target and non-target like construction, I couldn't evaluate it um, without first saying that they use the markup. Okay, so it's the use of the marker regardless of the appropriateness of the use of the marker. No. Yeah, okay, well, that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. I was saying, I was saying that um, I looked at the use of the marker first because there were instances where they used the marker but it wasn't actually expressing um, power, in some cases, possessive, etc. So I counted for them. I, I tallied the markers first and then tried to determine what the, the intent was. So some of what you're seeing in the, in the examples might have been disregarded when I did the final count. I didn't do Male and female had no difference in terms of performance. Um, what caused the difference was really age. And because across grade levels, you had an overlap in age, um, I didn't use it. Because then I have to map each error pattern to the age rather than the grade. So in one, in a grade seven class, the age range was 13 to 17. So I couldn't say grade seven was doing X because it would depend on the age of that person that was assigned a grade seven class. So the students are batched based on the level they have acquired, not on biological age. 
amusing, amusing chronological age. I can't talk about what they, the grade, because the grade is something that teachers put in this. And it's subjective because you can be 20 and be in a grade 9 class. So I didn't want to group them by grade. Gender had no bearing on whether or not they got anything because boys and girls made the same mistakes and there were more girls than boys, so it was already skewed. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. Um, Professor Emeritus uh, at Stanford University. His area is psychology and figures um, and is one of those um, interesting people that Professor Devonish has been collaborating with over a long time. And I, um, I tell you a, a, a little story while we wait um, that Professor Thomas is the, the numbers man. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you clarified what figures mean. <laughs> 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 is the numbers man. Um, so into numbers uh, that it dazzles um, linguists, um, people who deal mostly with words. And I'm saying that because uh, both him and Devonish had submitted a joint chapter to the, um, the book, uh, the first book that I edited. Um, co-edited with Lars Henriks, and I remember I thought it was a fascinating paper. I didn't understand what was going on in it. <laughs> it was fascinating. Um, but I understood enough to know that it would have moved our understanding of uh, um, variation and the Creole continuum forward. Um, but the editors of the volume thought it was um, too technical. Uh, the, the editors for the series thought it would have been too technical um, for linguists. I should have pointed out to them that Hugo yeah. Devonish is a linguist and was able to decipher all of that. So that's the um, history. Um, I think that's the first time I got introduced to, um, to Professor Thomas. Never um, heard that story. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, so it has been a long, um, very long collaboration. So It's always nice to come back here. I was here for As a, as an undergraduate in 1960. So it's always nice to come back. Uh, the plains are not as pretty as they used to be in those days. Uh, there used to be ample space for, uh, for maneuvering at night, but now it's all buildings. And it's also good to see old friends. Uh, Umar Davies took time out from his busy schedule uh, not as busy now as it was in 1995 when you were a minister uh, of, 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 I think it was, uh, everybody knew you, you ran the country in those days. <laughs> Anyhow, so it's good to be back. So thanks very much, Joseph, uh, for having me. Uh, Creole linguistics is one of Hubert Devonish's interests. In fact, it was one of the 11 uh, interests shown on the call for uh, papers that Joseph sent us. I don't know if you could find it on that uh, list, but it's actually there. It's the last uh, item on the list. Um, and it may be the least, um, but it is the topic that we'll be discussing uh, today. Um, it's also a reminder that this year is the 50th anniversary of a seminal conference in Creole linguistics held right here uh, at Mono. And one of the uh, reference in Hubert's and my, and my work is a, is a paper in that conference by De Camp, and I'll get to it. Uh, the work itself started when I was here on sabbatical in 1995. I was a visiting professor of mathematics. I'd met Hubert a couple of years before at Stanford. And so he started coming to my office in the math department once a week. I think it was a Thursday. And uh, we would talk. He had data. I'm a statistician by training. 
I was housed in, I've always been housed in psychology departments, but it doesn't change the genetic uh, preference. I, I'm a statistician. And so I want to talk about that joint work we started in 1995. Some of it was published uh, 10 years ago at a conference. It's, um, the topic is the allowability of sentences in the Guyanese Creole uh, speech community. Uh, so consider a sentence, uh, I am reading. Uh, it's a, it has two slots. The first one is the uh, first person singular, which is either pronounced I or me. And the second one is the uh, post verbal, uh, the continuative progressive marker, which could either be rendered as ing or uh, pre verbal uh, as a. Ah. So, the versions would be, I am reading, and I'm giving you, just to anticipate the notation I'll be using, wrong brackets, and then inside the, the variants uh, coded either as E for English or C for Creole. So the first sentence is uh, English subject I, uh, English verb uh, I'm reading. The second one, is me reading, the third, I a read, and the fourth is me a read. Me a read is acceptable, allowable, um, it's pure Creole. I am reading is pure English, it's acceptable, so that's one of the constraints we'll uh, allow that all pure sentences are allowable. The issue is what mixed sentences uh, are also allowable. And in the case of Guyanese Creole, Hubert and I would agree, we don't agree on everything, because I'm from Barbies, and he is from, um, I want to say Georgetown, but it's really a outskirts of Georgetown, anyhow. Uh, so, but we agree on this one, that um, that third one is the one that wouldn't be, uh, right? I, I mean, you guys would feel free to agree, because there's a subjectivity in here that I don't think Hubert uh, allowed when we first started talking, but still. So we're going to have those constraints. All pure sentences are allowable. The issue is going to be the mixed sentences. So, so when Hubert came into my office, he said to me, you know, it's a, constraints mean one thing to a mathematician. It means something else to a linguist. So we had to uh, uh, discuss what he means by constraints. So he said, look, if there were no constraints, then you got n slots in general. I just showed you n equals two. And you could put uh, an e or a c in either slot. So how many combinations? Two to the n. But clearly, that's too many. Not, no, no language, would, no, no speech community would, would tolerate that amount of, of, of um, variation. So that's what is meant by conjectures. There's something going on that constrains some sentences to be viewed as acceptable or allowable, and others aren't. So then Hubert said, you know something, man? The number of allowable sentences, if you got n slots, is n plus one. I looked at him and I laughed. I said, man, that can't be true. Things like that just end true in life, you know? For, because the first, in the first place, he and I, we agree on a lot of things, but we didn't agree on every single sentence. So, but it took a little, not a lot of time to realize that what you need to do is to have a stochastic or a probabilistic version of this rule. Don't tell me the number of sentences. Say something like the average number of sentences, and then I could accept it. So that's how we're going to view it, this kind of probabilistic view. So what, is, what Hubert was saying is that there was uh, a regularity. Now, mathematicians, they start to drool when you see a regularity, because you can write it down, a n equals n plus 1. So now the question becomes, uh, what sort of mechanisms could generate, uh, generate this regularity? turns out, of course, that this n plus 1 rule was introduced at this conference, the seminal conference, 50 years ago by DeCamp, De Camp, in a model he presented called Implicational Scales. Uh, and he, DeCamp, De, De got to this rule uh, by constraining uh, the, a particular aspect of the situation. If you take the slots 
and ask, what are the Creole variants? So you got me, Irene. You can order them according to the camp on the basis of their relative Creoleness. That's the implicational scale. It turns out that once you do that, you could then order the, uh, the, langu the sentences, the, the, the mixed and the pure sentences, with respect to their Creoleness. So this implicational scale, it, it, it does two things. It orders uh, uh, variants or words like me and Ari, these Creole variants, and then it orders people, because the person generating a sentence could be put on the same scale. So it's a really attractive model. And I still find it attractive, even if linguists don't like it. You know, it, 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 it's really, and I, I think it's a generative kind of model. Everybody should know it, even if you have uh, reasons to, to, to depart from it. Now, the question is, we have a regularity. And I know that I had some skepticism. A lot of people might have some skepticism is this regularity really true? And is it the only regularity? If it's not true, maybe there's some other regularity. So that there's a set of questions uh, concerning the regularity. And then we have the camp. The camp has this beautiful model, remains beautiful despite heavy criticisms. Are, in particular, people say there isn't any continuum. There's no unidimensional continuum. And if you want to get traction, at least you've got to have a multidimensional continuum, maybe. So there's a whole lot of discussion about uh, the assumption of a continuum. So the first thing I said was, well, what about if you don't assume a continuum? Um, could you then find another kind of model without a continuum, that could account for the n plus one uh, rule, then uh, would this other approach account for alternatives? If you don't like the n plus one rule, if you give me evidence that is not true, maybe this other framework that I've developed without a continuum uh, we de we've developed might explain other kinds of uh, regularities. And then, there's a set of questions about what is the right interpretation of a sub n. a sub n is the number of allowable sentences of length n. Is that the same as the number of language varieties? Uh, and I, I, at this point, I need a lot of wisdom of the linguistic variety uh, to answer. So what I felt was needed is a, what I call a general framework. You know, when, <laughs> when a mathematician uses that word, you got to watch it. There are always cons and pros. Uh, the con is that you have to simplify to keep the problem uh, tracked. Ten minutes? Well, all right. Um, let me uh, uh, speed up. So, for simplification, every variable could either be English or Creole. Now, I sit down here yesterday, and I hear about you could be Creole from the west of Jamaica, or you could be Creole from the east, and I start to... To, to, to despair because I have a simple model. So uh, you got to bear with me, okay? It might be that variables are ternary, and you can have a C1, a C2, and so on. The focus is going to be on the number. Give me a sentence of length n. Count the number of English variants, and that's all I want to know. Length of the sentence and the number of English uh, uh, variants. And the focus is on the sentence, not a corpus, even though... That's what I eventually would like to go to. And um, I'm not going to assume that Creole variants are ordered. And in that sense, this is going to be a general approach. So um, notation S for sentence or string, length N. And in any string, E is the number of uh, English variants. M is going to be the average number of uh, N strings, uh, with a string of length N, with E, little e, uh, English variants. And then if you want the average number of, of, uh, of N strings, you just add up all of the M, uh, N sub E for E less than, for E going from zero uh, to N. So th that's just some notation. The approach is going to be Consider how you get a sentence of length n plus 1 from a sentence of length n. 
So take a sentence I am reading of length two. To get a sentence of length three, you could say I'm reading something, the books. You could say the books or the book them. Uh, you could say instead of I am reading, I was reading. So you introduce the past tense. This, is, this has three slots and so on. And then uh, you, these are allowable. Let's say you start with an allowable two sentence. And how, how do you proceed to get an allowable three sentence? Some of them are allowable and some of them are not. Another way of presenting this, uh, what I call an extensional approach. Here is a, a, an N sentence. Uh, put another, an N plus one slot. And the question is, if this is allowable, was the chance that this one is allowable? This slot could be filled by an E or by a C. And the probability of allowable, I'm going to write this P sub E and P sub C. And so this general approach boils down to specifying two functions, PE and PC. It'll have parameters, it'll have a functional form, uh, and so on. Here's another way of presenting this extensional approach. I want to end up with a sentence of length n plus 1 uh, from a sentence of, that is allowable of length n. So I want to end up n plus 1 length with e uh, a variance, well, there are only two ways of doing it, and this will simplify the problem. I could start with a sentence of length n with e var variance and add a c. So it doesn't change e, but it changes the length. So I can get here starting with n and e and adding c, or starting with n and e minus 1 and add an e. So I, there are two ways of getting n plus 1 to, to n plus 1. There's a certain number of transitions here denoted by M, and notice the subscripts N and E. Here it's N and E minus one. Then there's a probability that each of these is gonna be allowable. You multiply number by probability and you get an average number. There are two sources, you add them up, and this is the um, recurrence relation. You can do this thing iteratively. You can get the number of uh, N plus one, uh, of length n plus 1 with e variance from uh, the, the, the number, if you know mn, you can know mn plus 1. So that's the way we uh, proceed. And the problem is to specify these functions, p. Well, you want the functions to have some desirable properties. So if you add an e to a pure Creole string, uh, string you don't want the probability of allowable to be zero because then you would never get mixing. So if you start with a pure Creole and you add an E, there must be some chance uh, that you'll get an allowable uh, string and that's what is gonna allow for E and C mixing. So this point here can't be down here zero. So this is a parameter. I'm gonna call it compatibility, thanks, because uh, what it is, is the probability that E and C go together. They are compatible. They can co-occur. So that's why I use the word compatible. And then if you have a, 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 a string of length N and E, all of them are, is a pure English string, and you add an English variant, you're, you're going to still have a, an allowable thing. So this probability, when E is N, must be 1. So these functions must all have this property. So you gotta get from here to here, and you can clearly do it in a lot of ways. The easiest way is to draw a straight line, but here are some other ways of doing it. So what I'm gonna show you are the results of these two models, the straight line and this one, which is interesting. Let me point out the difference here. This probability is minimal for most of the uh, region, and then it jumps up. And it's gonna al allow for some interesting uh, results. All right, so that's the strategy then. Here are the results. The linear model, the straight line. Here is in the solid curve, the n plus one rule. You can get to the n plus one rule uh, in this general framework by specifying the p's to be linear and to set the compatibility parameters equal to one. If you change the parameter from a one to something less than one, this is not an n plus one rule. If you make it 1.2, this is not an n plus one rule. So the n plus one rule exists on a sort of knife edge. If you move off of the knife edge, you don't get n plus one. 
in this sense then, this is not a logical argument, this is a kind of aesthetic argument. If I tell you that something only happens when P is one, and P could be any number, you got to say that this something that you're seeing is rare. So I want to kind of wave my hands and say, yeah, plus one rule, if it ever is true, you got to be a rare phenomenon. It's not, it's not a stable state of nature. Here's what happens when you use that nonlinear version, the, the, the one that stays low and then just jumps up. Uh, this one here, this first line, I'm plotting it on a log curve. So this one here is the um, maximal rule. But apart from that, once the comp compatibility is not too high, you get this up, it goes up and then it comes back down. And I've done uh, simulations, it always comes down to two. So with this second model, you get this limiting case that the number of allowable sentences as n becomes large, that number tends to two. And here again, you get excited because you then say, well, this is a nice result. It must have some meaning in reality. What could be a meaning? Well, suppose I say, what, what I mean by a speech sample being allowable is that it's a very long sentence. And if you, uh, if you would allow me to make that stretch, then I would say this model predicts that as long as the compatibility of English and Creole is not so high, uh, you can only get two language varieties. I probably have about a minute left, so let me, um, let me uh, wind up. This is an approach that I would jump into just because uh, I like um, this kind of thing. Uh, and I noticed that noting yesterday my friend Hubert was, was portrayed, correctly so, not only as a scholar, but as an activist. So I'm here to tell you that he's also a bit of a nerd. And this is the nerdy side coming out. Okay. Eh? You don't want, just a bit of a nerd. All right. So maybe I'll pull him more in my direction. So uh, if your interest is in fine-grained linguistic effects, not um, uh, the, like whether the first slot is a noun or a verb or, or, or the phonological context, this is what linguists are interested in, then I don't really have anything to say to you. But if, as sometimes yesterday you showed, you were interested in coarse ideas, not fine grain, and things like lexical overlap, number of language varieties, English Creole combat compatibility, these are the, at, this is the level at which this kind of modeling, I think, has some, uh, some use. So what we have here is uh, a framework for accounting for a range of regularities. The n plus one rule is one, but there may be some other things like the number of varieties tending to two. Uh, and so you don't need a different theoretical framework for every different data regularity. And this, therefore, is something I like, an economy, therefore, uh, of theories. And then uh, there's a lot of work to be done. What does a linear thing mean? What do these uh, compatibility parameters mean? Uh, my kind of um, guiding principle is that a good theory is a really useful thing. Uh, and, and so people, <laughs> people must like theory because it helps you in practice to make uh, decisions. And, even though I can't tell you how it was applicable to a lot of the things from yesterday, I, I, I just felt that there were things like uh, when somebody put up a list of uh, the languages with some heritage languages, you know, I'm, I'm thinking is AN two, does AN tend to two or three or four? So I'm trying to see how the theory is relevant, but clearly this is the point at which I wanted to call Hubert and ask him what I should put on this slide, but then I was severely constrained. This is a, this, this is a surprise, so I couldn't, uh, couldn't call. So all I could, uh, so I made up this last slide. I really don't have anything to say on this slide. My time is up, and, and my content is up as well. But I can say that it is a lot of fun doing interdisciplinary disciplinary research, and I really want to thank Hubert for dragging me along this road. It's been a pleasure uh, both getting to know you uh, and getting to know you in the last two days. Uh, I'm really impressed. 
by the value you've added to people's lives and the value you've added to the discipline of, of linguistics. So thank you very much. Yeah, I was going to, it, it does, just so with the phone call, the response, when you call me now on that, that you couldn't call, the call that you couldn't make. Okay. Right? So it, you're assuming I, I've just called you? Yeah. All right. And so you're in the response. It says simple, right? Um, if, the, if it is that the, uh, it's not the N plus one rule and that the probability of getting an, uh, an, a non-matching uh, item, right, or non matching mm -hmm. variant, right, is less than, the, than generated by the N plus one rule. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have a situation where two language varieties, the English and Jamaican, don't mix, or English and Guyanese in this particular case, mm -hmm. can't mix because essentially that anything other than the N plus one, one rule, right, lower than that, mm -hmm. right, is going to mean two language varieties that do not mix, okay? Because I remember, remember how the graph go. After right. a while, it come back. Yes. Uh, right. Okay. Yes. Because in the end, they're gonna they're gonna stay separate. Yes. If on the other hand, it's it generates more than the n plus one, what you basically are moving. Remember, it go up high. Yes. Towards, and infinite, everything becomes allowable. Yes. So it's either. So what's happening is the n plus one is the is the is the is the, is the nice in between that says you can mix but not too much. Mm -hmm. But if you go, if you allow for, for a more mixing mm -hmm. than the N plus one, mm -hmm. one rule generates, you, mm -hmm. you end up with an infinite, right. a gotcha. total free mixture, gotcha. right? right? And at that point, you don't have language varieties anymore right. because anything is sayable. Right. 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 So how to have your cake and eat it right. is in that nice in between where you have two language varieties right. and an allow mixture in between. So it allows for them to stay separate and still interact. Anything lower than that means that they stay separate with no interaction. Anything higher than that is that they mix totally and there are no, there's no distinction between English. It's just a mix of forms. So I'm not ready to concede that because I could imagine that there are uh, stable solutions with three and four and five. It's just that. I, I can't see it theoretically. I got to do it uh, well, by when, calculations. Well, what happened? The answer I give you is what well, I gave you 25 years ago when you sent me that same uh, <laughs> a graph. So I just walk in from memory. All right? But, Hubert, isn't the N plus, rule, N plus one rule too constraining? Um, you have, um, give me an example of, but only in the sense that when you under the words um, advice. In terms of the form mm -hmm. and gave them all the yeah. Now what we found was was not that they was full hundred percent agreement. Mm -hmm. But, but it was, on the average, average it was true. But on average, basically, um, then you looked at the average e number of responses for each one of them, it conformed yeah. and it was one group. It yeah. wasn't like you could get some people will, will accept uh, IRE, some yeah. nannies will, but very few. So that in the end, what was generated was a probabilistic version of the N plus one rule rather than an absolute. But, but it's still the case that N was less than nine, eh? and you got plenty of values of N above nine. So we don't really know that the N plus one rule holds for all N. Right, but maybe that's the way. What do we mean by a language variety? You see, we can't mean the number of sentences of length n. That is not the definition of language varieties. So then you've got to ask how to use the model results to mimic this concept of number of language varieties. And I'm saying one way is to say, imagine that a variety is a sentence of infinite length. And then you get two in this case. So Anyway, uh, uh, so a quick question. Um, 
So when you talked about slots, I was thinking syntactic slots, but then I realized you're not talking about syntactic nah, slots. Just length. Because you're, yeah, but even that's confusing because you have I am reading and you had that as two slots. And, and then I you have I was reading three. as two slots. And that became. As three slots. As three slots. Yeah. And that didn't make that. So now you got to talk to you, boy. Don't talk to me. Hey, <laughs> how is it that I am reading and I was reading are diff a different number of slots? That's not, that's not possible. contains binary values um, for all of it. I know when the examples are given, they generally use syntax. Um, although, to get the continuum, um, the camp is not using each binary value, but he's lining up all of the values and how individual speakers would um, produce them. I was wondering if it might not be useful to step away from syntax and use phonology instead. Where, and, and not, not consonants, because they can't use consonants. Uh, but use vowels, since we can get a much wider range in vowel production. So if you want a continuum of um, you know, varieties, it might be useful to focus on vowels um, instead of uh, things where the, the, the number of values, um, at least in terms of just impressionistic, um, you know, so tend to be constrained. Unless you look at the discourse level, there are only so many ways, um, syntactic um, arrangements that you're going to get, which is why you would get uh, um, not a lot of variation that the, the, the model would seem to predict. There's an infinite uh, um, number of points between between R and R, for example. Uh, so we don't write that. Uh -huh. Right. So it becomes a, we, yeah, yeah, obviously for something like this, there is a the concept of the linguistic variable is what we are working with here. Yeah. Right? And the linguistic variable ultimately requires you to have members of you know, in other words, is this or that? You right. can you can but still get the members. You, you can still get the no, variants. No, but here's what you have. You're going to end up having to make arbitrary cuts. <coughs> cuts about it, yes. right? Yes. And, yes. And, and you run into the same kind of problems that you're criticizing us for. So it's best to work with stuff that you can. It's like it's best to research with our guys. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> what was the last sentence? So it's best to, to look. Where there's Where is it? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. But it has to be half a um, second. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, Professor Thomas, I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I must admit, I kind of checked out of mathematics when they introduced long division all the way back then. So, so I, I followed what I could. <laughs> but so in, in terms of um, you know looking at the the language varieties, right? Um, especially the, the confusion sometimes that the average Jamaican has, that what is the difference between English and Creole, and why is this one English, but, but, but this uh, sentence isn't. And I think for the average Jamaican, the inclusion of one Creole element, mm -hmm. it, it's no longer English. Mm -hmm. So English is measure, measured in terms of purity, but not patois. At least yes, that, yes, that, yes, that, yes. Is the, that is what I've seen yes, people yes, 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 making yes. Uh, judgments on. Yes. Now, is it possible that your theoretical model here mm -hmm. could be used in, in, in that kind of way? So, so for example, mm -hmm. um, persons who here at university or wherever teach Jamaican Creole or Guyanese Creole, mm -hmm. um, could it be used in, in a way to determine that this sentence is definitely 
a Creole sentence as opposed to a Creole sentence being influenced by English or being, having some English interference and therefore the person who is marking it can decide that, oh, this sentence is, is not good. This paragraph or this, uh, or this um, essay is not a good example of Guyanese Creole or, or Jamaican Creole based on what your model is presenting here. The, 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 we're not there yet, man. Not I there tell yet? you, we, we're not there yet. <laughs> I, 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 won, I left Guyana really in 1960. And so while I wanted to defer to Hubert, I realized that even if I had stayed in Guyana, my Creole it would have been a little different from his. I come from Borbis and he come from Georgetown. So I, 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 yeah, I feel very unqualified uh, to answer. But, but you know, I'd give it a shot, you know. Yeah. yeah. Of you yes. that would be so ubiquitous that yes. you're going to be a body or an agency yes. that yes. determine that this yes. passage that is written in Creole is not only grammatically correct, but it is in the proper register. Yes. It, this is no formal pattern or formal Guyanese yes. Creole. Yes. And, and, and imagine that you know, theoretical models like these might yes. be uh, some kind of assessment tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I believe really so, you know. know. I see possibilities. Yeah. Ian, 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 yes. Ian. Okay, so um, we have to move on. And finally, I can introduce somebody who I taught. <laughs> um, so um, our next presenter, Ronald Francis, also a student of the St. Augustine campus of UWE. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I, I taught him in undergrad. And uh, um, He's now pursuing a PhD in linguistics and working on varieties from his native um, St. Lucia. The title of his presentation is uh, Hole the Laptop, which is W-H-O-L-E, uh, and he's looking on an analysis of spelling errors in the writing of St. Lucian um, students. Um, you are you're a trained teacher? Or, or just a teacher? For, you, you have taught. Are you asking me? Course. Yes. Yes, Ronald. So he has taught um, before in the high school system, um, and that had mm. um, triggered his interest. Uh, some of the errors that he saw in his students' work, and so um, mm -hmm. when he came to UWE, he thought that that was something he should pursue in order to provide. Uh, um, a fix. Turn your phone off as well, please. All right, so you will share your screen with us. Uh huh. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right, so we have um, two little issues there. Um, the internet connection is being problematic. 
And also, I just realized that I forgot my charger at home. But Patrice is right there. So if my laptop cuts off, um, I will switch over to um, Pat's laptop, I think, within a minute or so. OK? Um, can I, I'm not sure again if you can hear me because the internet connection is very low. So can I get some kind of feedback just to confirm? Yes, we can hear you. OK, fantastic. All right, so again, my name is um, Ronald Francis. Thank you for that um, introduction, um, Dr. Farquharson. And just a small anecdote, um, since I really enjoyed the classes that he taught me in undergrad, was that I got 84 <laughs> in one of his um, classes. And I really wanted 86 or 87 in order to get an A+. Plus. And I sent him an email saying, can we speak about my exam paper? And Joseph said, one mark could have been negotiated, but not two. And that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> so that was, a, um, I also want to say, um, I'll give a word to Professor Devinish, who never, well, who never taught me personally. But of course, I've heard so many things about him. And I have read Language and Liberation, which is one of the most inspiring books, I think, for a young Caribbean linguist to read. Um, so first, um, in the order of my presentation, I will talk about my PhD thesis on a whole, um, just a little bit about the rationale, the context, um, try to zoom in on my study a little bit, and then a little bit about spelling and some of my preliminary results, um, which are based on the smallest of the 12 schools that I'm looking at. And I will try to draw some conclusions um, within the time if I have enough to do so. Um, People who have seen presentations I've done before have seen the first um, 10 slides a million times, um, which is that there's a general problem, I think, in the Caribbean region, which is having one official language in multilingual space. And St. Lucia falls squarely within that problem, which is that you have some people who are native speakers of St. Lucian French lexicon Creole, and also um, Vessel, which is vernacular English of St. Lucia, as it has been termed by um, Hazel Simmons MacDonald and Garrett and other people who have studied it. But the problem is um, that people who are native speakers of the minority language or the Creole languages, um, they have challenges because public institutions do not accommodate them. And people have done research in um, the health sector, the legal system, and in education in particular, where my research is coming in. And the problem is that these people are automatically excluded from these public institutions because they need some kind of help to navigate the system. Um, again, the linguistic situation in St. Lucia is that you have French um, lexicon Creole, or what we call Creole, um, St. Lucian Standard English, which isn't really a thing um, that has been documented or studied extensively, and then an English lexicon Creole um, that has been termed Vessel by some scholars and Slev by other scholars. Um, basically, what is considered St. Lucian Standard English is conventionally American and British English. Uh, uh, it's accepted in the secondary, in the education system. Um, as a teacher in, the, in high school, we accepted any form of British or American English, even though British English was preferred. Um, and what vessel is, is basically an area of contention as well. Some scholars say that it is re-lexified Creole and that it includes a lot of Atlantic um, Creole structures. Some people think that it is closer to English, actually, um, than French Creole. I will adopt the position that um, there are parts of vessel that look like Creole, and in, in a way they are re-lexified Creole. I won't enter into the argument too much here because there isn't any time, but I elaborate on that in my thesis. Um, and there are other parts of vessel that look like English. So whatever um, is in the essay, that is non-standard, but looks more like English, bears greater semblance to English. I have considered um, a non-standard English form, and whatever um, can find direct translation into Creole, I have considered basically a re-lexified English form, and that is what I refer to in my essay as vessel. I will talk a little bit about how I derive that a little bit later on, and I'm open to more of the multiple um, criticisms that I've received in this area. Um, there are a few things that are exclusive to Vessel, and I discuss each one of them in turn as they, as they come about. Um, more on the problem, um, I, as I said, I was teaching um, at St. Joseph's Convent in St. Lucia, and it basically changed my life. I was marking common entrance, which is the entrance exam into secondary school. 
And uh, I had major disagreements with the other examiners at the table that I was at um, on one of the year, um, for one of the years that I was working. And it was because of that I got inspired to do this research, to actually look at common entrance essays and try to determine the issues that students are having. Are they old, are they new? And how do they affect um, placement into secondary school and how the examiner, the person sitting at the table, perceives the student um, that is being examined at that point in time? And in doing the research, I found out naturally that these issues are not new. Um, this is a policy document that was made in 1993. I must have been five or six at the time. Um, but basically, it said that there is a need to recognize all languages in the society as equally valid and to see multilingualism and multidialectalism um, as positive attributes. Um, linguists before me, of course, have said that West Indian learners of English um, with Creole or Creole related backgrounds are not native speakers of English. Um, I, I, dis I, I disagree slightly with this document because I think that there are many people who have strong competence in English and in Creole, and we should work to bilingual competence, of course. But the fact is the students who have strong competence in the Creole languages need some kind of assistance with um, in the education system. There is also a monolingual bias for speakers of English, which has led to the underutilization of, multiple, of multilingual resources in our society. And my favorite part of the paper, which said that much harm can be done or is done in education because of the incorrect diagnosis of the problem. And that is where my research comes in exactly, diagnosis. So I think before we talk about curricula or strategies for teaching or pedagogy, we need to find a way to determine whether or not a student has stronger competence in Creole in St. Lucia or in English or some kind of a very lingual code switching prowess, um, which we have not done here too. And that's the, my research I'm hoping will become one of the foundational things in that regard. Of course, Carrington, who wrote the grammar of Quayol, said that any scientific approach to teaching must be preceded by an analysis of um, Quayol and what he called areas of interference, even though the term is not um, really popular in second language learning right now, between languages. And what he means by that is mother tongue influence, basically L1 or prior knowledge, what a student comes into the classroom with, and basically how, what kind of transfer happens between the L1 and the L2. And he spoke about the need to look at that in both speaking and writing, which is where I'm zoning in. But what that means is that we cannot just assume that every student that comes into the classroom is the same, but look at individual competence. What is his struggle? What is his L1? And what prior knowledge does this particular student have? And not assuming that one size fits all in terms of a teaching strategy for students. Um, because my um, research is focused on writing, just a few notes on writing here quickly from um, my favorite source um, in all of those I've used so far, which is Singer and Bashir, who said that writing is not a natural extension of speech, but it uses the same psychological domain as speech, which is the cognitive linguistic domain. Um, we cannot divorce a learner's linguistic competence or prior knowledge from the writing process. It means that however a person speaks or whatever the person knows, that is what will appear on the paper. That means that in generating text, the writer must draw upon phonological, morphosyntactic, and lexiosemantic competence in order to formulate knowledge and ideas into linguistic units. So I'm not saying that every single thing that is done in speech um, can be done in writing. We know that that isn't true, but I'm saying that definitely, definitely what is on the paper, what we're marking um, for, the, for the exam, the essays that we are picking up for the students, they are a strong representation of a student's linguistic competence and whether or not a student is, um, has greater competence in Creole or in English. There are previous studies um, that looked at basically Creole interference or Creole influence in the writing of students. The two relevant to St. Lucia um, are divergent in their conclusion. So Wint and Gingell, who were two British teachers who did research in St. Lucia in 1994, said that previous research made the unwarranted assumption that because an error um, in writing could be attributed to Creole in interference, then it must be attributed to Creole interference. So they basically said that Creole should take its place um, at the bottom of a long list of issues that students have in writing. Um, before them was Martha Isaac, um, who looked at secondary school students in 1989. And then she said that there was a gap in linguistic ability and comprehension due to faulty or incorrect structures and dialect interference. So she basically put Creole at the top of the list in terms of the struggles that students are having. Outside of St. Lucia, um, Lise Weiner did the same in Trinidad and agreed basically with Isaac. 
Um, again, Isaac, um, 1986, sorry, not 89, Winston Gingell in 1994. James did the same for Tobago, looking at verb structure, and drew a conclusion that was closer to Isaac. And Ad et al. did a study in Dominica in 2004, and their conclusions were closer to Wink, um, Winch and Gingell, um, who did the study in St. Lucia in 1994. So there is no consensus, really, on the role of Quayol um, in terms of how students perform academically in writing. My study um, starts off by identifying everything in the writing that I consider a non-standard form. So basically, if it isn't correct English, based on the conventions that we have of English so far, I consider it a non-standard form. And then I proceed through two taxonomies, um, three taxonomies, sorry, or basically long lists and categories based on um, verb form, syntactic structures, um, etc to divide them into three separate groups. So non-Creole influence forms, that are things that are due basically to English complexity, what people, what Brown calls mistakes, um, and what other people have called um, basically errors, um, what they have referred to as, the term is escaping me now, um, intrinsic errors, or errors that are due basically to in English complexity. Then there are things I call Creole influence forms, which are things that I categorize as exclusively belonging or um, belonging to transfer from Creole or from the Creole language. A few of these features are shared, meaning it's impossible to distinguish between non-Creole or Creole influence forms. I refer to these as unattributed forms, where they are a very small group, and I discuss again each of them um, as I go along. My research is focused exclusively on the Creole influence forms, even though I mentioned the others, and the relationship between a high incidence of these forms and the academic grade. So that is Ten where minutes. my PhD is really centered. Was that, sorry? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? What? <laughs> So, of course, I have looked at verb forms, I presented at verb forms, word choice errors, noun errors, and um, clause and phrase errors, but I was having a lot of issues with spelling errors, and that is what I looked at in preparation for today's presentation. And I basically um, took off spelling errors from one group and categorized them into non-Creole and Creole forms, and I will discuss um, the types of errors that I received, and I'm open, of course, to all, type of, all types of um, feedback in that regard. I will just run through the method um, because I'm running out of time here. Um, I basically use error analysis as my methodological framework. Um, the steps were identified by Corda in 1984. So it's basically about the identification of errors, classifying these errors, um, stating relative frequency, and number five, which is most important to me, um, the determination of the source of error, or basically whether or not it's due to transfer or just English complexity. Um, I collected a large sample of data, um, um, which is 580 scripts in 2015, um, 580 scripts from the actual common entrance exam. Um, I collected 12 schools um, within districts. They were randomly selected, districts all over St. Lucia, and it's a cross-section that represents the entire population, which is um, basically all primary schools. I'm looking at 20 scripts, um, which is a combination of scripts from two schools for this paper specifically. The basic unit of my analysis overall is a, punctuated, a fully punctuated sentence because um, punctuation is part of what I am testing. And I basically deem a sentence grammatically acceptable if it is superficially well-formed, that is grammatical, but acceptable if it is also contextually appropriate. So that's what I refer to as grammatical acceptability. If it is lacking grammaticality or acceptability, it becomes what is a non-standard form. At this point in time, the sentence is tested by my Creole influence structure taxonomy and some kind of direct translation. And if it matches any of these categories, then I consider it a Creole influence form. So in this case, you have the Creole influence form, the boy swing the bat, because you have um, a zero marked stative, um, non-stative verb there. If it does not meet any of these categories, then it is tested by the non-Creole influence form. And if it meets one of the one criterion in that, for example, the boy swinged the bat, where well, you have the correct English form, but this is simply due to the fact that um, you, this is irregular in English and not necessarily Creole influence, then it becomes a non-Creole influence form. Um, I do consider it shared, for example, if you get a form that belongs to both things. And if I cannot determine it, I put it, um, determine exactly where it came from, I put it in the non-Creole influence form category, just because I want to be very conservative about what I consider Creole influence in my work. All right, so spelling on a whole, and I'm rushing through a bit here, is that researchers are not really sure um, exactly the role of um, 
sound or how we speak in terms of reading and writing. So they have not determined the extent to which reading aloud is based on rule governed print to sound translation procedures um, um, on its or its relationship to the mental lexicon. So we've gone back and forth in this area um, for a long time. The biggest study in this area is phoneme graphing correspondences as cues for spelling improvement, which was done by the um, Department of Health and Education and Welfare in the United States in 1966. It's like 1,200 pages long, and I really have not finished it. But basically, they said that a lot of spelling issues are developmental and not necessarily due to anything outside of normal cognitive development. Um, they highlighted the innate complexity of English. Of course, that is my emphasis. And two examples of that are X, for example, is two phonemes, right? So it's K, K, and S, or the fact that um, English is quite opaque in terms of the relationship between graphemes and phonemes. So E, that sound has multiple spellings, for example, I think about um, 12 of them in the English language. So in terms of um, looking at the results, what I tried to do was divide the spelling errors that I, that I was seeing into non creole influence forms, and I looked at um, four types of errors. I didn't have time to elaborate on my full methodology, but I basically looked at addition of items, omission of items, misselection, and malformation. And what I found was that you often had addition, so for example, inserted spaces or extra letters, so afraid with an E or began with an E or a space inserted and outdated, for example. And these things are just due to English complexity. There is no Creole basis, at least based on my research so far, for explaining um, these errors. It's simply due to the fact that you have multiple graphemes or multiple forms of spelling one type of sound in English. You often had omission of letters and spaces as well. So for example, if I remove the E in before, it doesn't change the spelling whatsoever. Or just the letter I, for example, can also produce the sound E, so students will mistake what is happening and spell believe, for example, as um, just I. English has numerous, for example, um, double consonants, um, which are historical and have nothing whatsoever to do with pronunciation. And in words like carefully, for example, we have an example there, or words like a lot are often um, spelled without the space, even though the space is required. So there are a lot of things that are due to English complexity and have no, um, are not due to transfer of the queer language. You also have misselection of items, so bullying, for example, the child is just not aware of spelling conventions of English, or report, because OU in the word poor, for example, has the same sound as um, fun, as in report. I suppose you can make an argument about the lack of roticity, making that distinction. And one of my favorite examples, which is see here, um, as in laughed, for example. So um, the English um, inflectional morpheme, ED, is devoiced when it is, atta um, is attached to some sounds and then voiced when it's attached to other sounds. So that because it is um, pronounced T, the child has actually spelled it as T. So again, this is due to English and the nature, the opaque nature of English and not due to Creole influenced forms. But there are some things, oh, um, one more note before I move on from this side. Um, Sometimes there were multiple errors in the writing as well. So in raining, the student has over-included a letter there. In the child has deleted the I after the A, but also added another letter. So sometimes there were multiple forms that were non-creole influence. These were few and far in between. Usually there was just one spelling error in each word. But of course, there are some things that we can classify as creole influence or belonging to speech. And I see Patrice flashing me here that I have very little time left, about five minutes, but I, I should get through it. So one example is come and take, and you have the misspelling and, and this can be due to the, pronunci um, the pronunciation in St. Lucia, which is um, un, for example, or an, depending on the accent or where the person is from. And we can account for that through TD deletion or cluster redu reduction of homo organic sounds or sounds of the same voicing and place of articulation in English. Also, St. Lucians pronounce um, um, TH or theta um, as F, for example, thing. This is also popular. In, um, this also happens in Barbados, according to Peter Roberts. And because of that, the student has actually spelled it as thing, for example. Um, before a vowel, or the before, and vowels, the vowel R before nasal sounds is often pronounced as the wedge. In the word dumb, for example, so instead of saying dam, or instead of saying hand, um, as in that trap vowel that we know from, from um, Wells, it is often pronounced as the, as the wedge, which is a, uh, and students, um, because of that, misspell 
are before vowels and spell it as U. So we have an example here, which is I don't give a dumb instead of I don't give a damn. Right? So all of this um, is example of grapheme phoneme correspondence or the fact that the student is taking um, queer influence in speech and it's reflecting in the writing. Also, we have here when I look in the bush, because the upsilon or the uh sound that we have here, which is required here, as in words like good or in words like bush in English, in standard English, for example, is not part of St. Lucian speech. That you have a lack of differentiation between u and e uh, and sometimes the wedge. Um, so because of that, the student has selected a grapheme or double O, which more commonly represents the long U tense vowel in that case. So we've got a lot of that in the writing as well. So when I look in the bush, instead of when I look in the bush, for example. And just to justify what I'm saying, I, I took some data from another paper and presentation that I had done in which I showed that the vowels that are selected in St. Lucia do not match um, received pronunciation or general American, for example. So the kit vowel that you'd get in general American or that short capital I is most often an E or the trap vowel in American English um, and sometimes in RP as well is most often an R but sometimes a wedge in St. Lucian English. And I even showed differentiation between Trinidadian English as well. And um, the foot vowel, for example, which is an upsilon in American and British English, is often a long U, that tense U sound with length in St. Lucian English. So it shows more of the phoneme influence. And then my absolute favorite error in all of my research here, which is homophone confusion resulting from phoneme influence. So here, because we have the same thing that we discussed earlier, which is deleting um, alveolar stops. Um, uh, Patrice is telling me time done, that done, but I'm going to beg for two minutes or three minutes to finish, even though my time is finished. Um, because of that, you have stops deleted in word final position, very common for Creole languages and extremely common in St. Lucia, that um, inadvertently creates whole and therefore in pronunciation creates a homophone and the child has selected the wrong spelling because the homophone confusion has been created from the TD deletion. So that um, explains the error that is in the title of my presentation where the child said, if the Ministry of Education will not let me use the laptop as I please, um, they can hold the laptop, meaning they can keep it. I do not want it. If they're going to put restrictions on the laptop, let them hold the laptop instead of hold the laptop. Um, spelling has implications for other things. I don't know why I label that example X there. Um, but it has even implications for syntax, for example. So you have the omission of letter or letters um, where it creates some kind of inflection in terms of, and it's, the letter is part of the inflectional morphology of English. So a load of, a load of book instead of a load of books. And then we know, for example, it's well documented, Crowley and Holmes, Pigeon and Creole. Uh, even before I was born, spoke about the fact that Creole languages are not usually inflected to indicate number. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir when I say things like that. So plural inflectional markers of the lexifier language are, are typically eliminated from the morphology of Creole languages. So many students needed a laptop, that S is deleted, instead of many students needed a laptop, for example. So spelling even has implications for syntax. Um, it has more implications for syntax here, for example, in terms of possession. So you have the omission of the apostrophe S, for example, the clitic apostrophe S. And we know that in Creole languages, what you do is that you juxtapose the possessor and the possessed in order to um, indicate possession. So her mother rule. So because she was still under her mother rule, she should have listened. Or as soon as I arrived at Ray J house instead of Ray J's house, for example. So um, what I'm finding is that, again, in trying to investigate spelling, which is not the center of my research, um, but I'm seeing a lot of connections between spelling and phoneme influence, spelling and how students speak, and even spelling and syntax. So what is the conclusion of all of this? Well, on a whole for my research, just considering one school, for example, school A, which is the smallest one and has 10 pupils, it is that on one side, Creole transfer must always be considered, but it depends on the student. So one student from this school, 48% of the errors that he produced, um, well, he or she, because I don't know the gender of the student, um, I mark them as Creole influence errors, and this student receives 16 out of 30 in the essay, for example. So the question must be asked whether or not this student is Creole dominant. On the other side, some students have difficulty with just English complexity. So this student received 8.5 out of 30 in the essay, 
um, but only 0.05% of the errors were Creole influence. So it means that there is a need to consider um, whether or not a student walks into the classroom having difficulty with Creole transfer issues or just English complexity issues and not making a curriculum that is one size fits all. That said, 80% of the spelling errors that are found so far from the two schools and the question were in fact non-Creole influence errors. So while these phoneme things that I discussed are exciting, they only form 20% of the errors that I'm seeing in the data that I've looked at so far for this presentation. But again, what that means is that I'm going to remove this thing here so you can see my conclusions. Right, what that means is that um, students need to be diagnosed, as I said in the beginning, before teaching begins. So we have to know what a student comes into the classroom with. From a pedagogical perspective, even 20% is too high to ignore because it means that one student may have major issues with Creole as their first language and struggle in the classroom. And it also means that learner corpora, gathering large amounts of writing from students um, is important for, I think, developing curricula that are appropriate for the St. Lucian context. The, the Ministry of Education in St. Lucia burns the 4,000 or so scripts that they receive from students every single year after the assessment period. And I had to beg and pull all kinds of str strings just to get 600 scripts. So I'm saying if we get these essays and then we form a huge learner corpus and we're able to tag them and track the development and the issues that students are having, they can become very useful, I think, um, to developing pedagogical strategies and curricula that are better suited for our environment. And again, the goal should always be bilingual competence, not letting English be dominant and reign and, and feel like boss. We should, not, we should not continue the hedge money, as Patrice is whispering to me there, of, the, um, of English that we are seeing in St. Lucia and other parts of the Caribbean right now. So I am done talking. Thank you very much. I am open to your questions. Okay, thank you. We have five minutes for questions. All right, so um, I was struck by the way in which Creole was uh, referred to as a problem in the classroom um, and the idea of you know, transfer from Creole as a challenge or a problem to be overcome. Right, so my take on that is this. Um, if you have children in a classroom who speak a language that is completely unrelated uh, to English, then um, you could say that any transfer from the first language into English, you know, is a challenge. Okay, presents a challenge. Um, but in the case where the first language of children is an English Creole and they already have a certain amount of vocabulary in common, would it not be fair to say that the children in fact um, have an advantage and that their first language is to be treated as a resource rather than to be defined as a problem because transfer from the first language becomes a, an obstacle to learning the spelling of English when in fact it could provide you with a starting point or a springboard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hello? You don't want Can to everyone respond? hear me? Yes, you don't want to respond? Okay, yes. Um, well, I absolutely agree that um, it's not a problem. Um, I was quoting and that's why I put the um, Basically, I copied directly from the, from, from the report. I copied it and I put it on there. I was saying what was said by linguists before me. So I do not consider Creole a problem, for example. Um, I come from a family where you have numerous Creole dominant speakers, for example. Um, a lot of my grandparents and uncles, etc., cetera, are very limited competence, I would say, in St. Lucian standard English, and we only speak Creole to each other. Um, and my research is um, exactly about remedying this problem from saying that a, a Creole dominant student is somehow deficient when he comes into the classroom. The problem is that within the education system in St. Lucia is that every student who walks into the classroom is treated as if he is an English speaker. He or she automatically has some competence in English. And I think we do not take time 
to actually figure out what the student's competence is. So I, 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 my research is not all encompassing in that it can, it can tell us everything about every student. But I think if we take writing samples from students and then we put it through a taxonomy like the one that I'm creating, we can then determine whether or not a student is Creole dominant and then begin using the student's first language or prior knowledge as the basis of teaching English. So that English becomes a second language learning experience for that student, for example. So if my presentation gave the false impression that I see um, Creole as a, as a problem, like I do not. Um, I speak the language fluently. Um, I absolutely love the language. I speak it with my family, etc. I just think that what we are doing in St. Lucia is wrong, which is treating every single student as an English speaker. For example, so and and we and even though linguists before me who have done research in St. Lucia have said that um, some students are Creole dominant, no kind of um, test has been established to determine what a student's competence actually is. And I think the remedy to that, or one of the ways in which we can deal with that, is by looking at writing. So taking samples of the writing, for example, and trying to determine whether or not the structures in that um, in that piece of writing is it is closer to Creole. It looks more like Creole than it does English. And then we can determine whether the student is Creole dominant or perhaps is vessel dominant, as Hazel Simmons McDonald has suggested, or whether or not the student does in fact have strong competence in English before he or she comes into the classroom. So it's not it's not a problem. My research is about diagnosis and moving from there, about categorizing so that we know which strategy is best, either L1 learning or L2 learning strategies for each student. I hope I answered Professor's question there. <laughs> okay, yeah, she says yes. Uh, am I correct that you yeah. equated ungrammatical um, with uh, non-standard? Big pardon? Um, am I correct that you equated um, ungrammatical with non-standard? Ungrammatical with Creole? No, no, no. Um, when you were setting up your categories, um, you had a specific def definition of an ungrammatical um, string, mm -hmm. and then right. I think you said that um, those sentences which were deemed ungrammatical were classified mm -hmm. as non-standard. Right. Oh, you want to stick with that? Well, I mean, I don't know if I want to stick with that entirely, and I mean, you and I have had numerous conversations about terminology and, uh, and getting it right. Because I'm using error analysis and working with um, mother tongue versus target language as my framework, I have started off um, by saying the essay in front of me, because when I received the essay, um, the common entrance essay, the student is attempting to produce English. So I have to consider that the target language or what is expected by the examiner is English. And because of that, I start off by saying that something in the writing does not look like standard English and I create and, and so I begin by saying it's a non-standard form and and the term itself I accept that it may be problematic and it may put people on edge etc but what I'm trying to say or at least what I'm trying to get at is that some of these things that are being judged non-standard forms are actually standard or acceptable quail forms yes but uh, um, the fact remains that that something is ungrammatical um, or, or that it's non-standard doesn't mean yeah. that it is necessarily ungrammatical. Oh, I understand what you mean. This is why you have yes. to pay attention to, to terminology. Now, there's a part you can treat English as a monolithic thing, um, even standard English. Um, um, mm -hmm. really. So you have to find better ways of talking about whether you use targets so um, there it, it deviates from the expected target. If we even know what that target is, uh, but not, because you have to remember that within the field, um, something being ungrammatical has a very technical meaning. And I'm sure that's not what you, you intend here. No. Uh, we have to leave it there. Um, but thank you very much. Thanks to you and Patrice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> All right, so this is the, the lunch break.